right, yes, lawn shift bower, you do not need to, well, I guess you do need to remember that name since there's an assignment due, right? I've never been the topic of an assignment before. <laughs> wow, this has got to go onto my bucket list somewhere. Uh, yeah, so I teach here at Salt Lake Community College, absolutely love it. I have some of my current students with us today as well as some other students I've worked with and I hope I'm looking at my future students as well. Seriously, I love this, okay? Um, yeah, as Jen mentioned, I have letters after my name, whatever, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, but really I like to think of myself as a perpetual work in process, okay? All the time. And that's to a tremendous degree a little bit of what, about, what I want to talk about today. So, because we're all works in process. And in fact, that's really why a lot of you are at college right now, right? You kind of looked at your current state and went, hmm, not sure this is where I want to be for the rest of my life. Maybe I need to, you know, implement some sort of process to change my opportunities. And so you came to college. Excellent choice, by the way. Okay. Well, it doesn't end when you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s. It's always going on. Case in point, I was supposed to be an oceanographer. So I was four years old watching a Jacques Cousteau show with my father. And I was just in awe. There was this dude scuba diving with a whale, and I was just like, had this religious experience. So I asked my father, what's that guy's job? And he said, he's an oceanographer. I said, that's it, I'm gonna be an oceanographer. And he said, yeah, whatever, okay, fine, you're four. <laughs> All right? Well, no, I took this really seriously, okay? So I went off to the library and I checked out every single book on oceanography and I never returned them, okay? <laughs> There are issues that I still have in Palo Alto, California. I'm not allowed back in the city, but you know what I mean, okay? I joined Greenpeace. I saved up my allowance and made a sweatshirt that said, save the whales, all that good stuff. I even went to France and learned French. Why? I wanted to study with Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> And so I had to learn French, right? This is the way that a child's mind works, right? Okay. But here's the deal. So I spent a year in France. I kind of skipped some school here, skipped some school there. I didn't really start going to school until the third grade. I'm not kidding, guys. I grew up in a hippie commune. We didn't believe in school. So I didn't go to public schools, didn't do anything. And, and frankly, I was a really poor student, very poor student. And I was young and I started, you know, I was really struggling in high school, which I never really went to. And one day I had an epiphany. I realized, hold it, oceanographers are scientists and scientists are smart. And at that time, I didn't feel so smart. And a little bit of me died inside because I realized I was not equal to the challenge of becoming an oceanographer. I chickened out. I chickened out, right? So now, yeah, that's all right. Don't, you know, go burning candles for me or anything. Life turned out all right. And by the way, I'm still interested in becoming an oceanographer. But I really have learned over the years, both, you know, heuristically, you know, through my own anecdotal life and through studies and watching other people, that we can always reinvent ourselves. It just takes understanding of how to do this and the courage to do it. When you decided to come back to college, that probably wasn't a light decision. Now, some of you might have come right out of high school. Awesome, great, you know, boom, boom. Some of us, hey, by the way, my first college experience, yeah, we won't talk about it, okay? I was one of those that had to kind of come back. It takes some courage to do that. Well, the book I'm writing right now is called The Courage to Succeed. 
And it is introducing the reader to what I call the ADEPT model. And the ADEPT, you know, as it says here, stands for accept, discover, eliminate, and take action. And basically what it means is that to succeed, there are some truths that you need to accept. You know, you need to accept that you need to plan, that you need to understand that you can't do everything, you can't be everywhere at once, so on and so forth. Then you need to discover what really turns your crank. We're gonna come back to that one, all right? You have to eliminate what doesn't turn your crank, you know, simplify, simplify your life. Make plans, take action, okay? Well, we're not gonna go over the whole ADEPT model today, you can't. What I do want to talk about, though, is the discover phase. Discover what matters most and gives you meaning and purpose. Okay, so now, if discover is all about finding what turns your crank, what works for you, what gives you meaning and purpose, why do you get out of bed in the morning, why is this important, especially if you're trying to reinvent yourself? Why? Why do you need to discover? If you don't know where you want to go, you don't know what you need to do to get there. Absolutely. Good. What else? Why do you have to discover what gives you meaning and purpose? Nice. If you're going to dedicate your life to something, you really kind of have to enjoy it, right? Get some sort of gratification out of it. Okay? Very good. And, and Bang on, right? Absolutely bang on. One of the ways I look at it is I say it's a question of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Now, quick primer, quick primer. Extrinsic motivation basically says, uh, if you pay me, I'll do it. You're not really into it. It's not your thing, but you need the money. So, sure, I'll take that job. Okay, that's fine. We all do that to a cer certain degree. Whereas intrinsic motivation says, hey, I'll pay you if you let me do it. Now, the reason I have the pictures I do is that back in you know, several lifetimes ago, I was a FedEx courier. And it was a good job, I enjoyed it. Golden handcuffs, good benefits, decent pay, fine, great. But it's not where I saw myself. I didn't see myself becoming an oceanographer driving around a FedEx truck unless I fell asleep and drove off the pier, right? So I needed money. It paid. It had benefits. I did it. And in many ways, that's kind of the lives we lead today professionally. I need the money. It's not a bad job. I can stand my boss. It's good. But intrinsic is really where we want to live our lives. Where we do it because we have passion for it. We love it. It's cool. Okay, I have my juggling equipment here. Okay, yeah, if you, if, if you, if you want to know the level of my geekdom, all right. When I was in high school, I learned to juggle, and I juggled all the time all the time. I spent hours and hours and hours juggling, okay? And I bought all the equipment. By the way, this is in my office. Yeah, I still hang out with it. It's, it's, it's sad. And, and I traveled through Europe juggling on the street. Pretty cool. I was lucky if I could buy a croissant by the end of the day. I totally did not make money. But I loved it. I was self-actualizing. I was living in youth hostels. I was, okay, right? The perfect world is if we can kind of bring this together. If we can make money to live a successful life and yet do something that we intrinsically enjoy, right? So. To do that, we really need to understand what gives us meaning and purpose. What is, you know, what, what is out there to discover that, that drives us? Now, one of the ways I've looked at this is by looking at five elements, okay? And I have, you know, a horribly, overly complicated Venn diagram here that shows you kind of the convergence 
of these five elements. And we're going to go through each one of these real quick, okay? Guiding principles, your passions, your strengths, your supporters, and your infrastructure. You know, you go from passion to infrastructure, and it's like, oh, whoa, wait, that, that's, that's kind of jarring, but it'll make sense in a moment, okay? So the first thing I want to look at are your guiding principles. Now, I want you to think about rivers for a moment. Rivers follow the path of least resistance, okay? You've heard that term before. They, they don't have to think about where they're going, how they're getting there. They just follow the path of least resistance. So, on one hand, you might say they're completely powerless because they're just following the, the you know, topography of the land, right? But no, nobody would ever call water powerless. This stuff is the chisel of our world, right? I mean, this stuff is pretty darn powerful. Well, here's the funny thing. Rivers followed the topography of the land, but they formed the topography. So they're following the path of least resistance, but they're the ones that determined the path. Guiding principles do the same thing for us. There are certain principles that will always direct our lives. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to mull it over. We don't have to spend time and energy you know, thinking through it. There are just certain things that form our lives. I don't remember the last time I woke up in the morning and said, I wonder if today I'm going to rob Trans Credit Union. It never occurred to me. It's a guiding principle that just says, I don't have to worry about making that decision, okay? Think about times that you've maybe had to deal with an addiction or something and how difficult that is because to break the addiction, you have to reform your topography. But once you do it, it's a guiding principle. I share with my students that I have a guiding principle of being on time all the time. And it's not even on time. I need to be early to make sure that everything works right. Sound, video, this, that, and the other. Because things always go wrong. But I never want to be that person that shows disrespect to somebody else by, you know, not being set. That's a guiding principle. So think about yourself for a little bit. What behaviors do you admire in others that you'd like to emulate? That helps you discover your, your, your guiding principles. What behaviors do you really frown upon, right? There's always something out there that somebody does that you're just like, oh my gosh, I don't even want to look at the guy. I'm so embarrassed for them, right? Again, this helps you discover your guiding principles. And then if you were giving a loved one just a few words of advice before they were disappearing for a long time, just some life advice. What would you tell them? Odds are that would kind of reflect some guiding principles on your part. Now here's the thing, this might sound obvious, but it's not. It's kind of like, you know, living in water. You don't really, it, there's a French proverb that says, you know, the fish is always the last one to discover water. Well, that's because the fish is in water all the time. You're in your guiding principles all the time, but it's a good thing to discover them, which is why it's part of the discovery phase, right? Okay, so the next one, passions. Discover your passions. Now, this is a picture of Julia Butterfly Hills, okay? Um, Butterfly here, she, there was logging going on in the Redwood Forest, and, uh, and she wanted the logging to stop in this old growth forest. So she climbed up in this tree to make sure the loggers couldn't cut it down. And she figured this would be like maybe a two week protest, right? Two years. She spent over two years in that flipping tree, okay? because she had passion for it. That's intrinsic motivation. When you can dig down deep and do something like that, that's incredible. But now, I also want to point something else out when it comes to passions. 
you know, we, we like to think that our passions have to be grand and incredible and altruistic and benevolent and good for social causes and all that sort of thing. No. Here's the really cool thing about the world. There are a lot of people out there, and so there are a lot of different passions. And we can all explore what's really important to us and not worry about whether or not it's grand or noble or anything like that, okay? Me, I don't raise Pomeranians and try to get the blue ribbon. It's not my thing. But I'm perfectly glad that somebody else has the passion for that, right? I have a passion for teaching where somebody else might be like, yeah, no, thank you. All right? It's okay. All right? Your passion can be totally mundane, but that does not matter. Don't think about what the world thinks about your passion. Think about what you think about it. Because I'm not going to climb into a tree for two years, but I don't need to. There are people out there that can do that for me. Okay? So, you know, what are things that wake you up and kind of get you interested? Ask yourself this. If you knew you could not fail, what would you do? It might point you towards something that you have some interest in, but you've been afraid to explore. Um, what kind of people do you like to hang out with? Do you like to hang out with craftsmen, academics, business professionals, families, uh, athletes, social workers, what kind of people do you like to associate with and why? Why do you like to associate with this sort of person? What passions do they bring that are feeding you? Um, what accomplishments are you most proud of and why? And here's the thing, this is a question for yourself. You don't have to, because I don't want somebody to say, well, here's the thing. This is the accomplishment I'm most proud of. But really, let's face it, it's kind of a little thing. It's like, eh, it's not little to you. This is not a competition, OK? Which is why I tend to kind of, yeah, you know, well, on has a PhD and an MBA and a bachelor. And it's like, yeah, but that's not my passion, right? Now, if you ask me about my passion, I'll get all keyed up on it, which, as you can tell, right? What is it that you've done in the past that you're particularly proud of and that you wouldn't mind continuing? Okay? So, strengths. Now, you have guiding principles and you have passions. Now let's actually look at what you're good at. All right? Word of warning. Word of warning. If you're not good at it, don't abandon it. Okay, let's say for a moment that your guiding principles point you this way and your passions point you there and you go, oh yeah, but here's the deal, I'm no good at it. Don't worry, okay? But it is still something for us to, to take into account because here's the thing about strengths. Strengths open up opportunities. Without the strength, you really don't have an opportunity. So let me show you what I mean. Let's reverse this for a moment. Let's take the opposite of a strength and we'll look at a weakness. A weakness makes us vulnerable to threats. Let's say for a moment that I um, have an immune deficiency issue. I'm really, really, really susceptible to viruses, to illnesses, to infection. Well, that means I have a physical weakness which makes me at risk to any infection that might be out there. Spoiler alert, there's tons of germs floating around this room right now. But because we're all fairly healthy, we're not a, at risk. If I had deficient immune system, I'd be at risk. Same thing with the strength. Just because there's an opportunity out there doesn't mean that you can exploit that opportunity. You can only exploit it when you have the strength. So for example, um, you know, the, the Olympics are going to start in Brazil here pretty soon. If I got a phone call saying, hey, um, would you like to run the 100 meter dash? Is that an opportunity? It's not an opportunity because I don't bring anything to the table that would make that possible for me. You see what I mean? It's like, I can't run. I'm really slow. 
take my word for it. I'm really slow, right? So it's, it, our opportunities, our strengths are what make opportunities possible, okay? And I'll show you, there's a reason I have LeBron James here for a moment. Another thing about strengths is they're contextual. LeBron James is very tall, very strong, very agile, very talented. These are strengths that made the opportunity of becoming a star basketball player possible. But now what if his dream had been to be a horse jockey? <laughs> the very same characteristics and attributes that are a strength for him as a basketball player would be a weakness as a horse jockey, okay? This is one of the reasons we look at our strengths in discovering what it is we want to do. What are the things that we have that enable us to go a certain direction? All right? So, next. Oh, ask yourself. Oh, we went the wrong direction. What are you particularly good at? And I know that's a difficult question to answer. I know. We're kind of hardwired to be self-deprecating. I get it. I suck. Okay? But no, be honest with yourself. What are you good at? There are plenty of things you're good at. Take my word for it. Um, how are you thought of by your coworkers and family and fellow students and, and friends? How, how do they reflect upon you? And then, you know, what accomplishments are you proud of? We talked about these. What skills did you bring to the table? What strengths did you bring to the table to make those accomplishments possible? This will point you toward your strengths. By the way, uh, who here has taken the strengths quest? I know you've done strengths quest. Done strengths quest? You can do strengths quest, strengths quest through the college. Highly recommended, okay? Highly recommended, very good. Great way to help point you toward your strengths. Okay, supporters. Who do you have in your camp? Now here's the thing, in the United States we tend to be an individualistic society, okay? We don't tend to think in terms of the collective, we think in terms of the individual. We have phrases in the U.S. like, I'm a self-made man, I pull myself up by my bootstraps, don't, you know, give somebody a fish, you feed them for a day, teach them the fish, you feed them for a lifetime. My parents came to this country from who knows where with a dollar forty-seven and a jacket, right? We love the idea of individual achievement. And that's cool. Don't get me wrong. I buy into it. But it's a myth. Okay, we succeed because we have people in our camp supporting us. And we need to pay attention to who they are, and we need to understand what their drivers are so that we can reward and thank them in the way that has meaning to them. Now, I have a picture of Neil Armstrong, okay? I don't care what his guiding principles were, I don't care what his passions were or his strengths, he never would have gotten to the moon without support. And as it so happened, an awful lot of support. Okay? Now, you may not necessarily be going to the moon, but take my word for it. You have supporters. You have stakeholders. You have people that have a vested interest in the outcome of anything you're doing. In school, if you have family, they have a vested interest in what you're doing. Do you know what they're giving up for you to do this? Do you show them appreciation in a way that has meaning to them so they continue to support you? So one day, my, da my daughter is in, is, was in dance and uh, something she really wanted to do. It was a big deal to her, ballet. So every evening or you know, close to every evening, felt like every evening. We would take her to the dance studio and so forth, and this was a big deal, it cost a lot of money, yada, yada, yada. And every single night we'd pick her up and oh, she would complain. Oh, the teacher did this, the other students did this, my feet hurt, my leg hurt, I'm so tired. And my wife finally got fed up and said, you know, this is all voluntary. 
we can pull you out if you like, if you're miserable. <laughs> well, that woke her up. After that, every day when she got in the car, she said, I had so much fun, it was fantastic, it was glorious, hallelujah, okay? She forgot that she had stakeholders, her parents, who were giving up an awful lot to make this opportunity happen for her, and she wasn't feeding us in the way we wanted, which is, I'm having a great time, okay? Think about who your supporters are. And so to that point, who are your supporters? How have they helped you? Take a moment and really kind of think about how their support has helped you over the years, okay? Um, and then think about what do they expect in return? Now, they do expect things in return. Don't fall into the trap that says, well, family pretty much has to do it. Their moral obligation to support me, filial piety, all that sort of stuff. No, do not take your supporters' support for granted, all right? Resentment will build. Understand what's in it for them for you to succeed. Now, mind you, it might be just something as simple as a thank you, this is great, I'm really able to open up opportunities for me, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, what they want in return isn't necessarily monetary. But understand that they're giving something up to make this possible for you. What are they giving up? My wife um, is uh, right now finished, she actually graduates at the end of this semester, continuing her medical career. She gave that up for many, many years for me to go to school. And so after I got my PhD, she said, it's my turn, okay? And I said, yeah, absolutely, you bet. What she wanted in support is for me to support her as she supported me in school, okay? So take the time to figure that out. You also have people who support you kind of need, but you're not really getting it, all right? Kind of uh, your Darth Vader's, if you will, right? Folks that you, you really, you need their help, but, but they're, they're loath to give it. Well, why, why are they resistant? What do they want in return? What are they concerned about? Take the time to figure this out because they're the ones that are gonna help you ultimately. The last one infrastructure. Here's the thing. This picture, that's my workshop bench. That is a dual carburetor to a 1965 MG midget. Okay? Which means I have in my garage a 1965 MG midget in various states of disarray. I've had it there for about six or seven years. It's in various stages of disarray. I, I've maybe put 100 hours into it, okay? Well, now, why is that? You know, why have I got this thing in my garage taking up space for years and years and years and years and getting nowhere? Well, it's not that I don't know how to accomplish things that are important to me. So in the time that I've had this MG Midget, I got a PhD, I finished my fourth Ironman, um, I started a business, I published some books. So I know how to do a project and take it to completion. So then you must say, well, then this must not be very important to you. The PhD was important, you know, Ironman was important and, and yada, yada, yada. Nah, I, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. This is kind of reflection of something that's important to me for a variety of reasons. So why is it in this array? Because I lack the infrastructure. Let me show you what I mean. Um, time, time to do it. Well now, when you work a nine to five job, when do you work? Nine to five, <laughs> exactly, right? It's kind of a cultural norm. Nobody challenges you when you pick up your bag and head out the door. Where are you going? I'm, I, it, it's, it, I work. Yeah, well, where did you get off thinking you could go to work on Tuesday at 9 o'clock? No, no, it's a cultural norm, okay? So the idea of dedicating time to work, not hard, okay? 
Dedicating time to something like my MG Midget, oh my gosh, I'm, uh, it, I, I just have no time, or at least not built in, infrastructure. Um, how about expertise? Okay, I teach at Salt Lake Community College. I do consulting. I'm pretty good at what I do, all right? Not the best in the world, but I'm pretty good at what I do. I have the degrees, I have 30 years experience, um, all that sort of stuff, so I know my way around the block. I do not know the first thing about cars at all, okay? So I don't have that expertise. Mentors. I've been around a while. I know a lot of people who know more than I do about my job, and I can tap them on the shoulder at any time. You know, hey, when you had to go through this, what happened with you? When you experienced this, what was your solution? I have access to some mentors that can really help me out. There are very few people masochistic enough to take on a British sports car, okay? Sure, you've got YouTube, but it's not the same thing. Facilities. I have an office right over there. I have classrooms, I have all this cool stuff. If I push the buttons in the right sequence, I can make magic happen. I have the facilities to do my job as an instructor. Here, I have a two-car garage that I share with my wife's car and my entire family. It is full of bikes, it's full of camping gear, it's full of gardening equipment. It's full of garbage that we can't bring ourselves to clean up. It's, it's a mess. I do not have facilities that are conducive to working on this, okay? Um, finally, tools. I have laptops. I have, you know, all the tools, the connectivity resources I need. I've got some wrenches and some screwdrivers. You're not going to be successful, okay? So it's pretty much... a foreordained conclusion that I'm going to fail at this. It's still in my garage, I'm not selling it. So the question is, what infrastructure do you have that can really make success possible for you? Stuff that you don't need to go out and create for yourself because you've already got it in place. You know, scheduled time, support from others, access to tools, resources, expertise, facilities. Oh, by the way, I missed accountability. If I don't show up to work, it's my butt, right? If I don't work on my car, I get dirty looks from my wife, but she's understanding accountability. It might sound cool to say I'm not accountable to anybody, I'm my own boss. Uh, it's actually kind of problematic to be your own boss because you know, you can BS yourself a whole lot better than you can an accountable manager, right? What do you already have in place that's going to help you out? Or what do you need to create so that you can be successful? So just kind of coming back to what we started with, your guiding principles, just kind of set your autopilot, your passions, get you up in the morning, your strengths, make those opportunities possible. Your supporters are the ones that are there to help you out. Maybe you're missing some strengths. Your supporters will fill that gap, okay? They're gonna be there to help you out. And your infrastructure. By the way, infrastructure, you can also include your habits, okay? Habits that are just kind of going on all the time. Think of that as your autopilot. Okay, when you, you know, when you get up in the morning, you shower, you eat, you so on and so forth, that's part of your habitual life. Many habits help us be successful. Many habits hinder us. That's part of your infrastructure. You put all this together and you kind of figure the sweet spot and this is your greatest opportunity for success. And so as you kind of explore your collegiate careers, figure out what you want to be when you grow up and the direction you want to take your life, this is one mechanism you can use to discover what matters most and what gives you purpose and meaning. Because as you pointed out, 
with purpose and meaning, we can really be, bring our best selves to the party. And that is everything I wanted to uh, offer today. If you're interested in learning more, this was the D in the ADEPT model. If you're interested in learning more, send me an email. We can chat. I love what I do. Strengths quest, that's an excellent question. So there's all these sort of psychological instruments or assessments, as they're often called. Strengths quest is one. You got the Myers Briggs is another. There's the DISC profile. I'm not a big fan. I'm actually not a big fan of these psychological assessment instruments. Strengths Quest is the exception. It's really quite good. It's also referred to often as Strengths Finder. Okay. Um, if, if you want afterwards, let's talk and figure out how we can get that for you. Because I know that s teachers can bring it in for their students. So you've done that, you've done that. Um, was it your instructor who brought it in for the whole class? A peer mentor over the summer and did it for training. Let's find out where, you know, who does that and, and we'll see if we can take care of you. Because it's, it's really a nice little tool. Have you, you've done, yeah, Jen's done it. What did you think? Did you like it? I really liked it. Yeah. I also like the Myers-Briggs type indicator. I use it in sales. Yeah, Myers-Briggs uh, type indicator is very effective in sales. Kind of, okay, this is where I'm coming from. What are you? Now I know how to marry up what I'm trying to accomplish. Very good. Uh, the three economic laws, okay, so that's on the A of the ADEPT. So here's the thing with the three economic laws. There's a reason why it's called accept, right, versus say understand, okay? There are many things that we already understand, but we don't accept. Let me tell you what I mean. If you want to lose weight, you take in less calories and you exercise more. Pretty binary. We don't like it though. We understand that that's the equation, but we don't like the equation, and so we look for something else, okay? We look for pills, and I'm there too. I ordered my Fitbit today. Maybe a Fitbit will make me fit. Yeah, right, no, it's eat less and exercise more. Yeah, I don't want it. Uh, technology. So the three economic laws are this. Your time and energy and brain power are in finite supply. There's only 24 hours in the day, you only have so much energy, and you only have so much brain power, okay? That's the first thing you have to accept. Now, believe me, we try to reject this all the time. Some folks might be multitasking, it's a myth, but that's one of the ways we reject the idea of these things are in limited resource. The second law, is that, um, you know, you can only give up so much, but here's the thing on the third side, while these resources might, uh, uh, the, the second one, while the resources might be in finite supply, the demand for them from others is infinite, okay? So your teachers want this much time from you. Your employer wants this much time from you. Your family wants this much time from you. Your physiological needs, sleeping, eating, you know, showering, wants this much time from you. Well, it's not preordained that it's all going to equal 24 hours. They'll all ask for an infinite amount. See what I mean? So then the third law is you're only going to be successful if you take control and fiercely allocate out your, these finite resources. You don't rely on the teachers. It's not like we all get together and say, now how much time are you gonna require the student? Okay, then I'm gonna require this much and you require that much and that way we make sure we don't overload the student. No, no, no. It's your job to make sure that you're not overloaded. Same with your managers. We, you know, you work, she mentioned earlier I worked at Intel. Intel will bleed you dry. They will try to get blood from a turnip, okay? As many of these companies do. And it's not their job to keep things in balance, work-life balance, it's your job. That's the third law. So, yeah, if you're interested, we can go over that. Oh, you don't wanna look them up. 
I have one called wet water. Don't read wet water. It's, it's an existential exercise in depression. It helps me. I think it's great. But my wife says that that's like, you know, either it, it helps people kind of put things in the context or it gets you utterly depressed. So wet water is one of them. And then I have a work of fiction out there called Flags Unfurled. It's just a, you know, techno thriller sort of thing. I like writing. This one I'm hoping to have done in April. I want to have this out and about. I'm on my eighth edit. And yeah, that's, a, that's an exercise in self-flagellation, editing your own book over and over and over. Yeah, it's, a, it's like Sisyphus rolling that hill up, uh, rock up the hill. I wasn't in the Peace Corps. I wasn't in the Peace Corps, but I, so here's the deal. My, my parents divorced when I was young. My mother went off to live in England. And I stayed in the U.S., and so I lived with my father during the school year and then lived with my mother in England during the summer. But then a year, I also stayed in France and went to school and went to school. I was enrolled in school. I didn't always go when I was in France. I did a lot of playing. Um, but then growing up in the commune, that's really what taught me a love for nature. You know, that's really what got me more into oceanography. That's why I know who Julie Butterfly Hills is, because, you know, we're into that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it was just, it also taught me I'm an experiential sort of person. I love experiencing things. I like to say that I excel at mediocrity, because here's the thing, you name it, Odds are I've done it just really poorly, okay? So, but I like experiencing it. It doesn't matter if I came in last. It doesn't matter if it's really awful. It doesn't matter if, you know, third chapter into my book, you're going to throw it in the trash. I just love the experience of trying something out. <sighs> Coeur d'Alene uh, in Idaho and Canada... Um, uh, Tempe, Arizona, and then the first one in Boulder, Colorado. Now, I was in the one in Provo many, many years ago, but that's the one where the guy drowned, and so that one was cut in half. So I did it, but it was cut in half. I don't really count it. So, and I, and I do really poorly. <laughs> I, I come in under the cutoff time, so it counts, but, you know, no, I didn't win, uh, at, you know, uh, admission to Hawaii. Um, the reason I went for a Ph.D. is pretty simple. Remember I said earlier I did very, very poorly in school, and I was pretty convinced that I was not smart, stupid, okay? That bothered me. That bothered me a great deal. And so I found that when I got my bachelor's degree, I still felt like I wasn't very with it. And so I did a master's, and I still felt like, hmm. And there was just something about, you know what, if you, do a, you know, if you do a PhD, that's kind of the pinnacle of academia, which I, I figured in myself, maybe if I earn that, I can allow myself to think that maybe I'm not as stupid as I have thought I was the, my entire life. You probably notice I'm getting a little weird and talking. It's a, it's a touchy subject for me. I really thought for many, 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 many years that I was probably handicapped mentally. And so that was something I really, really had to work through. And so the PhD was kind of my way of saying, dang it, I'm tired of being a dummy. I'm gonna do this and yeah. I've kind of grown past it, but it's hard to talk about. I was in special ed and everything. It was hard. I had a fear that I was as unintelligent as I thought maybe I was. And yes, I did not think I was equal to the task. So whenever you're thinking about college, and this is hard, and I'm not sure if I can do it, I'm not sure if I'm equal to the task, I'm surrounded by smart people, so on and so forth, nah, don't fall into that. You are equal to the task. 
four degrees later, I finally ran out of steam. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm really ever out of it. I still get really intimidated when I'm around folks that I consider to be exceptionally bright. I get very intimidated intellectually. So I still struggle with it. You know, and yeah, by the way, for all you kids out there in your 20s, yeah, when you're, when you, if you start thinking, boy, when I'm in my 50s, I'll have my act together and life won't be such a struggle, bad news. It's always a struggle. Don't be afraid of the failure. You're going to, persistence means you're going to fall on your face a lot. Um, you know, you talked about my, my consulting business. Yeah, I have a company. It was the fourth company I've started. First one lasted mere weeks. The next one lasted a few months. The next one lasted almost a year. This one has lasted five years. Um, so you got to be willing to learn that. You know, I, you know, you, you saw my juggling equipment earlier. There's a saying on, among jugglers, the difference between a good juggler and a bad juggler is a good juggler dropped the balls more often <laughs> because he had to learn it. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been fun. <laughs>